see so many of you here today. It was a really important message. I've been thinking a lot, you know, as we've been moving through this series on forgiveness and how does forgiveness work and, and how do we practice it in our lives and how do we find people who can be models for us of how to do that. I've been thinking of a simple difference between these two things. Can versus how can. The word can, like we can get caught up in can I heal, can I forgive, can I move forward, can I this, can I that. And I think in an era like this where a lot of people are living with a lot of anxiety, those questions ring very true and they can lead us to become very anxious. I know they can lead me to become anxious. But what if this? What if instead of asking that can, we ask how can? How can I move through the world? How can I deal with pain, unimaginable tragedy, challenges? And how can I do things? How can I find a way to heal? How can I find a way to forgive? Listen carefully. How can I find a way to build? With that, I ask you to please rise. Welcome our speaker for today. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a very warm welcome. It's my honor to be here to share my message with you. Thank you so much. So today, I'm going to be talking about choosing love and how to do that, right? Choosing love is actually something that impacts every single decision that we make on a daily basis. We're either choosing love or we're choosing fear, although we're generally not aware of it. But after today, you're going to be aware of it, and you're going to be mindful of your choices. I learned this lesson the hard way. Um, this chapter in my life began on December 14, 2012, when my six-year-old son was gunned down by a former student of Sandy Hook Elementary School alongside 19 of his classmates and six educators in one of the worst mass shootings in U.S. history. It was shortly thereafter I realized that I had a choice, that I could either become another victim of Adam Lanza, who was the shooter, meaning I could allow him to have control over my thoughts, because everything starts with the thought, your thoughts that impact your feelings that then impact your behavior. I knew at that time that I had a 12-year-old son, JT, Jesse's older brother, and I knew that he'd be watching my every move. I knew that the way that I handled this tragedy would impact the way that he handled obstacles for the rest of his life. And I didn't want this to define him. I wanted him to be resilient. So I decided that I was not going to be a victim, that I was actually going to take my part of the responsibility for what happened to Jesse. And in that way, I could be part of the solution. And I believe that we are, and I'm gonna talk about that solution today with you, and even ask that you join me in being part of the solution to the issues that we're seeing in our world today. This was the last time that I saw Jesse it was that morning, you know, it started out like a normal morning, like every other. I'm a single mom, two boys, work full time, commute 45 minutes each way, and uh, Jesse's father was picking him up at the end of the driveway. So I walked him out, turned around to give him a quick hug, and I noticed something. He had written in the frost of my car with his little fingernail, I love you. And he'd drawn hearts in all the windows. And I always practice being present in my life. You know, being, I really wanted to be present with my boys when I was with them. I felt like I didn't have enough time with them. So I was kind of freakish about it. I didn't even have a TV. <laughs> we still don't have a TV. Uh, and so knowing that that was one of life's moments, I ran in, got my phone, brought it back out, positioned him by his message, took a picture, and this became the last picture that was ever taken of Jesse. And it was my, my goodbye message that I got a picture of. And I'm so thankful to have that. And I'll give you a little hint. To have the fewest regrets in life, 
Be present. Be in the moment with those that you love. Make sure that they know that you love them. And I know that Jesse knew that, and I'm thankful for that. So in my mind, I was asking myself the same questions that everybody else was asking. How could something like this happen? And what can I do to make sure that it doesn't happen again? And actually, the whole movement to choose love, so we have the Jesse Lewis Choose Love movement, started at Jesse's funeral when I got up and spoke. And I said, this whole tragedy started with an angry thought in Adam Lanza's head. And I pictured him as a little boy having angry thoughts without the tools or nurturing environment to deal with those thoughts. We actually know that every thought we have impacts us on a cellular level. We also know, by the way, that every single person in here has between 60 to 80,000 thoughts a day that go through your head, single file, 60 to 80,000. We also know that between 70 to 80% of those thoughts are negative. We know this through research. So that means they're angry, non-productive, and don't serve us. That's the majority of you. So I asked everybody on that day to please start thinking what they thought. It's thinking, thinking what they thought about. Think what they thought about, right? Because the amazing thing to me is that a thought can be changed. This, this act of violence could have been changed at any time, right? So on that day, I said, everybody's been asking, what can we do for you? And I said, there is actually something that you can do. You can think about what you think about and change one angry thought into a loving thought every day, just one. And I said, by doing that, you'll make yourself feel better. You'll positively impact those around you. And through the ripple effect, you will make this a more peaceful and loving world. About a week later, so everybody dispersed to the four corners of the US after flying in for the funeral. And about a week later, I got tremendous feedback saying that that one simple act had completely changed people's lives. People had never thought about what they thought about. And it was true. A lot of their thoughts were angry. You know that gremlin in your mind that sometimes your worst enemy, yourself? They were able to change that just by being aware. So this is a tool that you're going to have in your toolbox for the rest of your life. This is interesting, and I wanted to share this with you. This is called a precognitive drawing. And this is a whole field of science where kids draw how they're going to die. And this is a, this is a phenomenon that happens all the time. So if you look at this, this came home in Jesse's uh, personal belongings. The FBI took all of his um, paperwork that was in his desk, stacked it chronologically in a box, and brought it home. This is, uh, this is what we call the angel and the bad man. So we have an angel, my pointer doesn't work, an angel on the left and the bad man on the right. This was like nothing else that Jesse had ever drawn, okay? If you look a little closer, it becomes very interesting. So the angel is in the shape of a 14. Go back one slide for a second. The angel's in the shape of a 14. Can you see that? Also in the shape of a bullet. People say that's what took him to heaven. And he has a little smile on his face. He died actually facing the shooter like this. So, the, and if, so now we can blow up the head to the next slide. The shooter. So you, you see that it's a pencil drawing where he just took a pencil and just kind of angrily colored in that head, right? But when we blow up the head, figures appear. And on the, on the right side of the head, you see a, a black, kind of a black figure, a black cloak, two black blunted wings, a little face at the top, wearing a ball cap with a hand that's holding a gun, and a phallic symbol screwing down into the head, which in medieval times denotes evil. On the left side, there's a figure that could not have been drawn. It is actually kind of like a rubbing. And it's like an angel. Do you see the halo? There's a well-defined face almost like a figure in a biblical gown standing like this. Can you guys see that? That's pretty cool, right? So what does that mean? What does that mean? So for some of us, that means those elements that are within all of us, right? Evil and good, 
bad, good and bad, right? They're in all of us, just a choice away. This empowering concept of choice, right? But it also, it also is representative of our thoughts, those same things, right? The thoughts that we all have in our head, including me, good and bad thoughts, angry, hateful, vengeful, and loving, kind, and thoughtful. We all have them. I love this, and I think that this is a good uh, story that's representative of what this is. Um, the Tale of Two Wolves, which is a Cherokee parable. An old Cherokee is teaching his grandson about life. A fight is going on inside of me, he said to the boy. It's a terrible fight. It's between two wolves. One's evil. He's anger, envy, sorrow, regret, greed, arrogance, self-pity, resentment, inferiority, lies, false pride, superiority, and ego. He continued, the other is good. He's joy, peace, love, hope, serenity, humility, kindness, benevolence, empathy, generosity, truth, compassion, and faith. The same fight's going on inside of you and inside of every other person, too. The grandson thought about it for a minute, then asked his grandfather, which wolf will win? And the old Cherokee replied simply, the one you feed. And I'm talking about thoughts. By the end of the day, or the end of the hour, we're going to know how to choose a loving thought over an angry thought, right? Because I'm going to give you a profound formula for doing just that. That was given to me by Jesse. So I love this quote by Viktor Frankl. Viktor Frankl was a Nazi Germany concentration camp prisoner, okay? He was brought to the camp with his family, and his family was immediately taken from him and gassed, murdered. Right? They, they kept Viktor Frankl alive because he was a psychiatrist. He was in prison for about four or five years, and he used that time in prison as an experiment. And he watched as, as individuals had everything taken from them, their families, their dignity. They were beaten and tortured. They were starved. But he saw that they did have some power left. And that was the power in how they responded, right? And he saw that those that chose, because it's a choice, those that chose to respond with love and compassion, they survived not only longer but better, right? So this is a profound, profound quote. Between stimulus, what happens to us, which we can't always choose, and response, there's a gap, there's a space. In that space lies our freedom and power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and freedom for every single one of us. So we have a lot of issues that we're facing in our society, okay? Uh, so not just violence, and by the way, since the, the tragedy at Sandy Hook Elementary School, by the way, almost five years ago, we've had over 230 school-related shootings. We have one per week in our country. Don't always read about it, but that's the truth, right? That absolutely cannot be our new normal. It doesn't have to be. Schools must be a safe haven, right? We know that, so bullying is increasing, despite our best efforts, right? We have these state-mandated anti-bullying programs, yet bullying has increased by 21% since we started tracking it in 2003. And by the way, that doesn't include cyberbullying. We have no clue. We don't have a handle on that yet. We don't even know how to, how to track that yet, right? We have trauma in schools. 20 years ago, there was this groundbreaking study called the ACEs study, which tracked childhood trauma, and it found that one in five kids were coming to school traumatized. There was a recent study in Connecticut that shows that over 50% of our kids are coming to school on a daily basis, having experienced a recent traumatic event. Substance abuse is skyrocketing, right? Despite our best efforts, and I don't need to go over all the statistics with you. You can just read, look at a paper, go online. It's in the headlines all the time, right? There are more suicides in the country than murders. And right about now you're saying, why did Pastor Chuck invite her? <laughs> right? Well, all of these issues, right, that we're experiencing that are actually, by the way, escalating despite everyone's best efforts, I want to ask you, who's going to fix them? Who's going to fix all of this? 
Wow. That's more we are's than I've ever had. This is a great group. You're right. We are. We're going to fix it. Uh, because we can't wait for our president to fix it. Right? But also, our last president had eight years. And these issues did not, I mean, despite best efforts, right, they still escalated, right? And you know why? Because it's not a political issue. All those issues, they're not political. They're issues of the heart, right? And we have to take responsibility for what's going on in our world in order to fix it, right? We can no longer stand by and say, uh, we're looking to Congress? We're looking to this, we're looking to that. When, what happens when, some, when something happens to you? What's your first response? What do you want to do? You want to find out whose fault it is, right? Who is there to blame? So we look at Sandy Hook Elementary, right? Who's to blame there? Well, right, right, obviously, it would be Adam Lanza and his mom, right? And I thought about that after the shooting. So his mom bought the guns, gave them to her, uh, son who's having issues and he came in and he's the perpetrator of the crime but that didn't work for me because I thought if it's truly their fault then it would never have happened before and it did happen before and it would never have happened again but wait a minute it's happened over 230 times since Sandy Hook Elementary whose fault is that I decided that I would have to take my part of the responsibility for what's happening to our children and our society. And only in that way can I be part of the solution, right? When we blame somebody, we're discharging, trying to discharge our pain and also responsibility. But in the same process, we're saying, whose ever fault it is, you're the only person that can fix it. I'm not waiting around, right? Not waiting around. I'm taking my part of the responsibility. And I'm hoping that you will join me. So the interesting thing is, we're all connected as human beings all over the world. This is one of the most important lessons that I've learned through my personal tragedy. Because when you think about it, when do you grow? Do you grow through happiness and good times? Or do you grow through obstacles? Do you learn those really important lessons through even sometimes trauma and personal tragedy? I've learned so much in the past five years. And I'm thankful for all the lessons that I've learned. And what have I learned? I've, my most important lesson is that we're all connected as human beings. We may look at each other and see perceived differences, but we're all the same. We're all the same, regardless of where we live, what color our skin is, what religion we practice or non-religion, we're all the same in the want and need to love and be loved. Every human being on the planet has that. We all want to love and be loved. And a lot of what we're seeing in our society simply boils down to lack of love, which is fear, right? We're wired to connect, actually. So we have these things in our brain called mirror neurons. And so I can't really see you guys because of the lights. But if I looked at someone who's having a bad day and I smiled, even if they didn't want to smile, something in their face would shift because we have mirror neurons and we're wired to connect. We're biologically supposed to connect to other people. And this is really interesting. Harvard University did a 75 year longitudinal study on the secret to happiness and guess what it is? Connection, positive relationships. And actually I learned that connection was love by little kids. I love talking to little kids because they just blurt out the truth, right? They're not programmed yet. They don't care what other people think. So I'll get them in an audience and I'll say, hey guys, what does anger feel like in your body? And they go, blah, inferno fire, headache. <laughs> and then I say, what does love look like? And immediately, so they're, they're in a big audience like you and they're not necessarily sitting next to their best friend, but they turn and they go, and they hug immediately without thinking about it. Or if they're sitting across from desk, they go like this trying to touch. In that way, I learned that connection is love, right? So it doesn't surprise us that the number one way to happiness is through connection and love. And we can actually choose this 
<laughs> we can choose it for ourselves and for others. And we're going to go through a powerful formula on how to do that. So my son, Jesse, left three words on our kitchen chalkboard. And he wrote these shortly before he died. So I came home. Actually, I stayed at my mom's. I thought I would never be able to go back to my farmhouse where I raised my two boys as a single mom. Uh, but I had to go back to get Jesse's clothes for the funeral. And it was on my way out that day, a few days after his murder, that I saw three words on the kitchen chalkboard. Nurturing, healing, love. Now those three words aren't in the vernacular of a six-year-old. They're not something a six-year-old would normally say. Phonetically spelled, because he was in first grade and just learning to write. But I downloaded so much information from those words. I knew immediately that if Adam Lanza, the shooter, in our instance, was able to give and receive nurturing, healing love, that the tragedy would never have happened. And I knew that it would be my mission in life to spread this message. I knew that there was some kind of spiritual awareness that Jesse had, that he wouldn't be around for very much longer, and he wanted to leave a message of comfort for his family and friends, but also a message of inspiration for the world. And I knew I'd be spending the rest of my life spreading this message. And actually, um, I invited a, universe, a doctoral university professor, the director of the Compassion, Creativity, and Innovation Center, to come over and look at the message. And I said, Dr. Cook, what does this mean? He said, let me go back to my office and I'm going to do some research. He did some research and called me 24 hours later and he said, those three words are in the definition of compassion across all cultures. And together we broke down the meaning of each of the words. And we found that nurturing means loving kindness and gratitude. Healing literally means forgiveness. And love is compassion in action. When you have the courage to practice those three character values, neuroscientifically in that order, and I'm pretty sure that Jesse didn't realize that, you're choosing love. You'll see why we put courage in there in a moment. But it really does take courage to do a lot of the things that we do, right, in our life. So I realized, I'm looking, I'm kind of seeing what's in schools, and I realize, oh my gosh, we have the solution right in front of us. In fact, it's been here for decades, and I was so excited. It's called social and emotional learning. It's teaching kids how to have positive and healthy relationships and connection. It's teaching them how to manage their emotions, be resilient, coping skills, how to feel compassion for themselves and others. There are decades of research on the power of social emotional learning, and it is in some schools, right? It's the number one way to have a safe school environment. It's the number one most proactive and preventative mental health initiative we have. Teaching social emotional learning proactively prevents mental illness of all kinds. It's the number one way to improve safe school climate and culture. And it's the number one way to give kids the 21st century life skills that they need and that employers, all employers, value the most. Social emotional learning, right? It's amazing. This is, this is the solution, by the way. And I think that you'll agree with me by the end of today. Um, and I always say, if anybody else has a better solution to the issues, raise your hand. And I might get behind it. I've dedicated my life to making sure that this doesn't happen again, to doing everything in my power. And this is what I've dedicated my life to, social emotional learning. I wanted to show you, so I said that there's decades of research behind social emotional learning, decades, 100% showing the value of how it, in, it, how it helps kids have a better life. Let me just show you one such study that came out at the end of 2016 on social emotional learning. Decades of research means that now they've followed kids from kindergarten all the way through adulthood. This is really interesting. So this study followed 800 children over 20 years. It found for every one point increase in a child's social competency score in kindergarten, they were twice as likely to obtain a college degree and 46% more likely to have a full-time job by the age of 25. This is a social competency score in kindergarten. 
Conversely, for every one point decrease in a child's social skill score in kindergarten, he or she had a 67% higher chance of having been arrested in early adulthood, a 52% higher rate of binge drinking, and an 82% higher chance of being in or on a waiting list for public housing. All the studies look like this. What's the takeaway for all of us? The takeaway is that social emotional learning is highly teachable and easy to teach at any age. And by the way, these skills and tools are not innate. We're not born with an SEL gene, right? We have to learn them. And we get a little bit better over time, but I realized that I didn't have these skills and tools. But they're easy to teach and easy to learn, and so essential for our society. What I did was look at all the obstacles. Why isn't this in every single classroom? Why doesn't every child have access to this if it's been around for decades? And I saw that there were lots of issues. Cost is the major issue. Some of the programs are very expensive, and for good reason, by the way, because they've had a lot of research done on them, right? Some have extensive teacher training. Uh, so we, I worked with educators, and we created a program that is completely free and it has all the best of the best, things that are evidence-based and actually work, data show work uh, in classrooms, including social emotional learning, emotional intelligence, positive psychology, neuroscience, character education, all the best of the best in one program. Uh, and so this is available now, it's on our website. If you're an educator or you're just interested, download it, take a look at it, teach it. We're here to support you. This is what's going to change our world because we are out to do that. And of course, it's free. It's been downloaded in 47 states and 20 countries by word of mouth, mostly my mouth, <laughs> uh, but also the educators that have been doing it and promoting it and loving it. Um, we've had incredible feedback. And this is, by the way, teaching kids how to choose love for themselves and others. We include love. Why wouldn't you include love? It's the most important choice that you make on a daily basis that impacts all the rest. And look at what happens when you do that. 100% of educators said they saw an improvement in classroom climate and students' overall behavior. More than 90% said their students got along better. More than 90% said their students have a more positive attitude. More than 76% said their students got better grades and test scores. Wow, teaching kids to choose love. What a concept, right? So this is what we know. We all crave connection, which is love, right? And we all just want to belong as opposed to fitting in. Bottom line, we all just want to feel good, right? And a lot of what we do, even if it's negative, is for that end point, to feel good, right? So, I mean, think about it. We can feel good quickly through anger, right? Because we get a good shot of cortisol or maybe self-righteous indignation, it feels good shortly, right? But actually, anger is as bad as smoking two packs of cigarettes, prolong anger. And so through, we'll, we'll try to feel good if we don't know through bullying, violence, drugs, even terrorist organizations, seeking connection, right? Or we can do it through choosing love. What does that look like? It looks like being compassionate, kind, caring for ourselves and for others. We just want everybody to know that they have a choice. Not everybody's going to choose it, and that's okay. I want to introduce Jesse really quickly because he's the genesis for all of this. He's the reason that I'm here. Jesse, best way to introduce him, he was born 11 pounds. So he was a C-section, of course. And uh, the first time I saw him, I was walking up to the nurse's station. And all the nurses were gathered around in front of the window taking pictures. So I walked up behind them and I said, what are you taking pictures of? And they said, there's this enormous baby <laughs> and he's trying to crawl out of his bassinet. And there was Jesse, you know how they have the clear plastic bassinets? There was Jesse, he'd crawled to the bottom of his bassinet and he was trying to get out. And if you think of the difference between an 11 pounder and like a normal seven pounder, that's quite a bit of a difference. So that's a perfect way to describe him. Kind of larger than life, full of energy, loud, really, really vibrant his whole life. Almost always happy. 
This is Jesse, a picture of Jesse on his sixth birthday. We have a little farm in the middle of Connecticut and he wanted all of his friends to have horse rides. So this is our horse Apache. Jesse's favorite things, by the way, were military men and army ducks. So little ar military men, the plastic figurines, and little yellow ducks. So he would carry around a Spider-Man lunchbox, half with yellow ducks and half with military men. So a perfect dichotomy of his personality, right? So when we were thinking about a logo, we thought, hmm, which one? Because we want to work in schools. Okay, we'll do the duck. <laughs> And uh, you may have seen um, the picture of Jesse with the military helmet. This was a helmet that my friend gave him um, six months before he died. And he wore this helmet every single day, okay? He slept in it, and he would get up in the morning, want to wear it to school. I'd peel it off his sweaty head. He'd go to school, come back home, put the helmet on, and uh, he was always pretending like he was a, a little military guy, right? Uh, and I think that that might have been some sort of spiritual awareness of what was to come and his mission, which I'm going to talk about in a moment. I want to talk about this incredibly powerful concept of choice, right? So Pastor Chuck was talking about can, right? I'm going to talk about another C word, and that's choice. We feel like there's so much happening, right, in the, in the world, like so many bad things, and they're all happening to us, and we have no control. That's not true. We have so much more control than we think, because it's our perception of what's happening. It's our thoughts about what's happening that really, really determine our response, right? And we want to have a thoughtful response, not an impetuous reaction. In the thoughtful response is how we choose love. Because, as we know, we can't always choose what happens to us in life, right? I certainly would never have chosen to have my six-year-old son murdered in his first grade classroom in his elementary school, right? But there is one thing that we can always choose. We can always choose how we respond in every situation, and we can always choose love. That also means, by the way, we determine how we treat one another in every single interaction. It's a choice. We don't always have the awareness that it's a choice. We become overcome, maybe, with anger and emotion. But by the way, it is a choice. Every single interaction that we have on a daily basis, we are choosing how we treat one another. We're also determining our reality by doing that. So Jesse that day was known as a hero. Jesse actually saved nine of his classmates' lives before losing his own. And for that act of courage at six years old, he was given a commander-in-chief funeral. A commander-in-chief funeral is reserved for heads of state and returning war heroes. And Jesse was actually considered a war hero on that day, because his classroom was a literal war zone. So the Choose Love message has gone all over the world and gotten a lot of attention. It's something that we can all relate to, right? It's not a polarizing topic. It's a uniting topic. Everyone can choose love. So I'm going to go through the formula now for choosing love because I want you all to have this as a, a skill and tool that you have. This, is, this will lead you to choosing love in your life in every situation and circumstance. It's what we teach in the Choose Love Enrichment Program, right? We start with courage and then we practice mindfully gratitude, forgiveness, and compassion and action. Everything starts with courage in our life. Sometimes it takes courage just to get out of bed, to put our best foot forward, to tell the truth. <laughs> By the way, I used to have a slide that says, this takes courage for students to do. It takes courage for all of us to do, right? To choose to do the right thing, even when no one else is looking. All of these things take courage. It takes courage to be grateful. Does it take courage to be grateful when everything's going your way? Not necessarily. But it does take courage courage to practice gratitude when things aren't going your way. 
that's when you really need it. Does it take courage to forgive? Absolutely. It takes courage to forgive, especially when the person who hurt you isn't sorry. We're going to talk about that in a minute. And it takes courage to step outside of the busy bubble that we all have. This, this little bubble of our existence includes our pain and suffering, our families, our jobs, our workouts, our friends, our social media, everything that goes on in our life, right? It actually takes courage to step outside of that, to look beyond yourself and to help someone else. So my mom calls this, this uh, formula a rope that you can hold down to yourself in any depth of well, in any situation. What's the first thing that you would do looking up, seeing a rope? What would take courage for the, just to reach your hand up to pull yourself out, right? But the first thing you would do would be to think of something to be grateful for. Gratitude is a great mind shifter. Remember all those thoughts that are going through our heads every day? They go through one at a time. That means that you can't have an angry, negative, fearful, low energy thought and a grateful thought at once. It's pretty cool. Try it. it you can't do it. So it's a great mind shifter, right? It doesn't mean that you can't have an angry, grateful, angry thought. That's where a gratitude practice comes in, right? So the first thing you would do would be to think of something to be grateful for. There's always something to be grateful for. I realized that following my personal tragedy. I had a lot to be grateful for still. Then the next handhold would be to consider forgiveness for yourself or someone else. And then compassion in action is looking outside yourself to help someone else. And once you've done that, you realize, you look back, you're out of the hole. That's choosing love. So our definition of courage is the willingness and ability to walk through obstacles despite feeling embarrassment, fear, reluctance, or uncertainty. We all have the courage that Jesse showed, actually. That's why I talk about it. We all have that courage. I want everyone to be mindfully aware. You do big and small acts of courage every single day. I want you to be mindfully aware that you are all courageous human beings. Check out the scientific benefits of being courageous, by the way. And this is funny. I was at a barbecue the other day, and this guy was, I had this Choose Love shirt on, and he looked at me and he was like, Choose Love, dude. And I said, oh, wow. Yeah, maybe in the 60s it was Choose Love, dude. But now there's decades of scientific research behind the benefits of choosing love. Want me to tell you? And he was like, oh, I'm going to go get a beer. <laughs> but look at all of them. And look at the bottom one. There's actually research that shows that when you have the courage to stand up to bullying behavior, and this isn't just students, by the way, or kids, it's adults too, that bullying behavior stops within 10 seconds. And we found that to be true. Gratitude is mindful thankfulness and the ability to be thankful even when things in life are challenging. Look at the benefits of gratitude. Holy moly. Look at the benefits of gratitude. <laughs> so many, right? But look, they all lead to greater happiness. And when you practice gratitude, it strengthens your immune system. It actually elongates your life. <laughs> you know that something that elongates your life has to be incredibly powerful, right? In daily life, we must see that it's not happiness that makes us grateful, but gratefulness that makes us happy. Forgiveness means choosing to let go of anger and resentment toward yourself or someone else, to surrender thoughts of revenge, and to move forward with your personal power intact gotten a lot of attention for my choice to forgive Adam Lanza, right? But in actuality, and this might be hard for some of you, when I looked at his life, Adam Lanza did everything that he was supposed to do as a little boy growing up, right? He did everything he was supposed to do. Kids that are having issues, they don't, they don't say, excuse me, excuse me, I'm having thoughts of self-harm and harming others. Can you please make an appointment at a psychiatrist at your earliest convenience? <laughs> right? They don't do that. But they do give you clues. Right? And there were red flags all along the way for Adam. And they were missed every single time. When Adam was in fifth grade, he wrote a book called The Book of Granny. And uh, he actually made copies, and he was going to sell it. 
And uh, this book was about a witch that came to the school with a broomstick. The top of the broomstick opened into a semi-automatic weapon and she murdered children. What's he saying? Help me. This is in my head, right? So when I learned about Adam and, 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 and really how we failed him, I felt compassion for him, right? And it was in that way that I was able to, to forgive him as well. I've learned so much about forgiveness. Forgiveness is the key to resilience, right? And I didn't know anything about it, by the way. Nothing. Because we don't talk about it. We don't understand it. If people pay me to speak, I say, uh, don't put forgiveness in the title because people won't come. But we don't understand it, right? Forgive and forget. Isn't that what we say? Well, that makes it an immediate impossibility for me, right? We think that maybe forgiving is condoning what somebody did. I'll never condone what Adam Lanza did. It wasn't right, right? We think that it means that we can't hold the person accountable for what they did. We're all accountable for our actions and our inactions. Forgiveness is simply cutting the cord that attaches us to pain. So I was giving, one of my first talks ever was on forgiveness to an at-risk youth group. And I'm talking about it, and this kid in the back raises his hand, and he goes, what is forgiveness? And I'm like, oh my God, I'm not doing a good job. So I said, all right, I'm going to show you what it meant to me. I felt like I was attached to the shooter with an umbilical cord that ran out of my side into his. All of my personal power drained out of me in the form of anger through this cord into the shooter. And I dragged him around with me everywhere I went because he had control over my thoughts that impact my feelings, that impact my behavior. Forgiveness to me was a big set of scissors. It was a choice. I took those scissors and I cut that cord that attached me to pain. Immediately, I felt all of my personal power running back into me. So the guy's back there going, okay, all right. Raises his hand again. How long did it take you to do that? And I said, that's a great question, because I did it relatively quickly. But it doesn't mean that I don't fall back into anger. And I talk about Jesse's seventh birthday, right? When we had planned this huge celebration for the first responders and gratitude for them and their service, right? We had invited a thousand people. My friend donated her farm. We had three bands. I got up that morning. I was in a dark place. Jesse should be there with me celebrating his seventh birthday. And he wasn't. I thought, what was I thinking? Celebrating? I was so angry. Did that mean that I, 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 I failed in my forgiveness? No. It simply meant that I had to take a step back, take a deep breath, and forgive again. What I learned is that forgiveness starts with a choice, and then it becomes a process. Actually, Jesus talked about this. Remember Matthew in the Bible asked Jesus, Lord, how many times do I have to forgive? Seventy times seven? Or actually, he said, how many times do I have to forgive? Jesus replied, 70 times seven. I remember being in uh, Sunday school, hearing that, doing the math, because I'm pretty intense. 70 times seven, 490. Okay, so if I forgive 490 times in my life, I'm good. And I'm going to count. This is what I was thinking. I don't know how old I was, right? But this sounds kind of ridiculous, but it wasn't until I was 40-something and, and following Jesse's murder that I realized what Jesus meant. He meant that forgiveness starts with a choice, but then it becomes a continuous process, one that you might have to do for the rest of your life. And it's okay. You know why? Because it gives you freedom. You're no longer a victim of the person that hurt you. Right? You get to call the shots. They may have started the story, but you get to write the ending. Look at all the science that's done on forgiveness. All the decades of scientific benefits that you get when you forgive. Check out the last one. It extends your lifespan. So our last character value in the formula for choosing love is compassion in action, right? Compassion has two components. There's an empathetic component, when you identify with someone's pain, and there's an action component. And actually, we get the benefit when we do something for other people. So check out all the scientific benefits of doing for others. And by the way, take a picture of it if you want to. Hang it up. Because you guys in this audience, 
This is what you do, right? We help other people. Check out, keep, keep going with the slides, check out all these. Releases a, a, a chemical mixture that mimic a runner's high. It makes us feel good when we do for others. Cultivates connection, better physical and emotional pain management. Oh my gosh, look at the, look at the bottom one. Adds years to your life. Studies show a 22% reduction in mortality when you do for others. So I say, if you choose love, you're going to live forever. <laughs> right? I mean, that's what the science says. It's pretty exciting. There's a ripple effect for everything that we do. And we know that every thought we have that impacts our feelings, that impacts our actions, ripples out. We can impact, the study show, 3,000 people. 3,000 people with one thought every day. Whoa, we have such incredible power. Every single one of us, I want you to know that. And we have this power to spread this message of choosing love, which can really impact the world. This isn't rocket science, but it is science. So I wrote a book called Nurturing Healing Love, and I was asked to send it to a uh, prison, right? Um, and uh, I thought, there's not going to be a convicted felon that reads a book called Nurturing Healing Love, but I don't mind donating it. Maybe the staff will read it. Maybe their families will come in and read it. And uh, so I took JT. He had the day off. He doesn't look thrilled, does he? But uh, took JT up to... <laughs> To speak, with, uh, to speak with the prisoners about the book, right? And uh, it was amazing. It was an amazing day that changed our life unexpectedly. These guys told me all they ever knew was anger, hatred, and resentment. And if you hurt them, they're going to hurt you and those that you love even worse. They never knew that there was an option to choose love. They certainly didn't know how to do it. And guess what? Every single one of them wanted to choose love. I'll let them speak for themselves. I love when it doesn't I work. Oh, there you go. I want you to choose love instead of revenge. It amazed me in the discussion we had how many people, just because of your story and your message, were rethinking the behaviors they've done. And not just rethinking the behaviors they've done, but literally coming up and saying, maybe I'm not going to behave this way going forward. And, and I thought that was one of the most powerful things because some of us in here have legitimate street credentials. These are people who you, you maybe saved lives, literally, multiple lives. And I think just your message when you come in here, before you got here, you had done that. Now with you being here, we're all rethinking something in our lives. And I want to thank you for that as well. You guys are my Choose Love Movement ambassadors, if you want to be. Seriously, you know? I mean, that's what I want. That's my goal. So this was actually a part of a documentary called Surviving Sandy Hook. There was a guy from the BBC that was there filming. And we did a decompression session in the warden's office. And he's shaking his head. He's going, no way. That's, no. That's not, those guys, uh-uh. No, they're not going to be choosing love. And he said, what you're saying isn't rocket science. And I said, he goes, it's, it's too simple. I said, I think the simplicity is the power of the message. So he went back a couple months later and he re-interviewed those that were the most outspoken about choosing love and dedicating their lives to choosing love. And he said, so you went back to your cell, nothing else changed, are you still choosing love? Every single one of them said yes. So I want to leave you with one final message that Jesse left. So on the same day that I found the nurturing, healing love on the kitchen chalkboard, JT, Jesse's older brother who was 12 years old at the time, went to his room, remember I was staying at my mom's house. Uh, so we went in uh, to get Jesse's clothes for the funeral. JT went to his room to get charging cables uh, and, and really important things like that. And uh, he found a little note that Jesse had left for him about this big on his desk, all folded up. When he unfolded it, he saw that it said, have a lot of fun. So this is a beautiful message from a little brother to a big brother. Jesse, who was bouncing off the walls in fun, right? And, but when I saw that, I thought, wow, that message is for all of us. One of the most important things in life, right? Choosing love, making sure that our choices are based in love and not fear, and having a lot of fun. I don't know about you, but I want to have a lot of fun. 
So now this has become my mantra. You know when life gets a little sluggish, right? And, and you feel like you have to do things rather than you get to do them? I have a little bird on my shoulder that says, you're supposed to be having a lot of fun. And I go, oh yeah. And it's like a light switch that's turned on for me. And all of a sudden I'm having fun. So I wanted to leave you with that. Have fun and choose love. And thank you so much for listening today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Broken down and tired of living life on a merry-go-round, and you can't find the fighter. But I see it in you, so we can walk it out and move mountains. Walk it out and move mountains. And we'll rise up, rise like the day. I'll rise up, rise unafraid. I'll rise up, I'll do it a thousand times again. And I'll rise up, I like the waves. I'll rise up, in spite of the ache. I'll rise up, and do it a thousand times again. You, 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 you. When the silence isn't quiet and it feels like getting harder to breathe, and I know you feel like dying. I promise we'll take the world on its feet and move mountains. We're going to walk it out and move mountains. And I'll rise up, rise like the day. I'll rise up, rise unafraid. I'll rise up. And I'll do it a thousand times again. And I'll rise up, rise like the day. I'll rise up, I'll rise unafraid. I'll rise up, and I'll do it a thousand times again. For you. But there we've got each other, there we've got each other. We will rise, we will rise, we will rise, we will rise. And I'll rise up, rise like the day, I'll rise up in spite of the age. I'll do it a thousand times again. And we'll rise up, rise like the waves, we'll rise up, in spite of the age, we'll rise up, 
I would do it a thousand times again, yeah. For you, for you. We understand this about God. God cannot turn away from us. We know that God's love and God's mercy can hold us even in times that are incredibly difficult. We know this beautiful line as well. See, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do not perceive it. I'm making a way in the wilderness streams, streams in the wasteland, and we will rise up. Charlotte's now going to join me for a final prayer, so please welcome Charlotte back onto the stage.